Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Barry Kenny, President of the PRI Council uh, this year, and you are very welcome to the National Council of Health joining us for uh, the Tuesday Forum today. Um, what we're trying to do in the Institute, obviously, is for these four is have topics that are of interest uh, to members and some non-members who potentially could become members as well, um, and uh, to have these well, at a time that suits, and I think certainly with the lineup that we have and moving to lunchtime, I think uh, we have met those uh, goals today. Uh, if you want to discuss what you hear today uh, on Twitter, uh, which I'm sure will be mentioned in some shape or form along the day, uh, if you use uh, hash P-R-I-I-T-F, T-F for, for Tuesday Forum, um, to, to, to share your thoughts on what you're hearing. Uh, we have a great lineup uh, across the world of uh, journalism, of PR and uh, indeed of online uh, media and I think in, in Pork, in Connor and Susan and Frank we have uh, for virtual uh, members of royalty in the Squitterati in Ireland uh, today. <laughs> so, um, as I say, I'm delighted to have Keelan to uh, chair proceedings uh, for us as well. So, uh, it is lunchtime, like people are busy, so I'll hand over to Keelan to kick things off. Okay, thanks very much indeed, uh, Barry. Well, listen, I mean, just to outline, I think Barry has, has introduced our guest, but Frank Lucas Gibbon, if for anyone who doesn't know, is, uh, of course, editor of the Sunday Times Ireland. Susan Daly is editor of the journal.ie, Ireland's only online paper at the moment. Um, Connor Pope is consumer affairs editor with the Irish Times and is formerly a, an editor at, uh, when it was Ireland.com, the Irish Times presence on the internet. And of course, Borg and Keon Zudol, and is director at Jewelry Communications. Um, to outline it, what we're hoping to do here briefly is kind of, first of all, look at the way media has changed, how social media has forced some changes on the newspaper industry in particular, how that has responded in both in terms of how it creates news and how it communicates with readers, viewers, listeners, whatever. Um, and then, after looking at those changes, look at how they impact the PR industry. So, I suppose if we, if we start, first of all, Porig, um, as a kind of, you're a non-editor here, if you like, but how would you describe the way media has fragmented so much? Well, maybe if I just put, for one, for one quick point, put it in context for, what I think anyway, for, for the PR industry, because I think it's important that, you know, when we set out to do our job, and, and obviously the guys will reflect on, on the other side of it, we set out to our job, fundamentally we, we have an interest to represent in some shape or form, and irrespective of the medium that we are choosing to use, or indeed the media that are out there that we might be engaging with, we ultimately, fundamentally, I think, as, as, as PR communications advisors and, and, and implementers, have to think in terms of we have a message, we have an audience, and then we have to determine what is the most effective channel by which to communicate that message to the audience in question. So I think if we all, as PR people, have to keep in context that that's where our job starts. It doesn't start with the media, uh, per se. But to come to the question, I think it's, you know, we have to be conscious that there isn't just one media. The media is a collection of its, its news, its reporting, it's analysis, it's commentary, um, it's assessment, and there are many different formats. Before ever you get as far as social media, there are already different formats that we've all become familiar with, and they've evolved over years. They've evolved, so, you know, magazines evolved out of newspapers, uh, you know, lifestyle TV evolved out of, out of uh, news programming, etc. So the existing media, if I could describe it, or mainstream media, MSM, have evolved over the years, and we've all become comfortable with them as they've evolved, and we've all become familiar with them. Um, and I started in the PR business 25 years ago when there was no business newspaper on a Sunday. And Frank would have been involved in the evolution and saw that change. So, you know, the media have changed and evolved over the years. And social media is a continuation, albeit a very dramatic, and in terms of the step up and pace, completely different type of approach, which clearly brings in the consumer and the public at large as contributors to the, to the conversation. Um, and I think, again, for us as, as PR people, we just have to, to, to take a step back from being led by the media and consider where, in terms of the increased number of media that are out there addressing different parts of our individual taste or different parts of our individual consumption, which, which parts are addressing the parts that we're trying to, trying to get through to. And in that context, yes, the proliferation of more media are opening up a situation where there is more that we need to know. Uh, that's the challenge for us. There's more that we need to know, but the fundamental objective that we have hasn't changed underneath the surface. And, and I think in, in broad terms, we now have the media that we go to for news. And that is, you know, fundamentally, it's devices like this. This is, if we want to know what's happened, I mean, I just asked Barry earlier on what had happened in the boxing this morning. And he immediately checked on his, on his, uh, his phone. 
and uh, mine is dead, that's why I hadn't checked it myself. So if we want instant news, it comes to a version of this. But if we want colour, and we want elaboration, and we want to understand what it sounded like, what it felt like, what the impact was. We looked at that story last night in Boyle, and you saw the, the, the people describing the neighbours, with the trauma, and the absolute, you know, the sense of loss. You were never going to get that from a social media, per se, or not the same volume and the same impact as you get from the, the, the traditional broadcast media. They can bring colour and elaboration to it. But then if you're looking for analysis, or if you're looking for depth of perspective, or if you're looking for a longer read, as Connor described when we were chatting earlier on in a particular context, you're more likely to go to the print medium for that, because it has the, 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 the form to do that. So I think the media is fragmenting in that way. Different parts of the overall piece do different jobs. And for us, the core is understanding what, for our particular objective on a given moment in time, what is the medium or channel that is best suited to get into the audience that we want to get to. Okay, and frankly, go to you as a newspaper editor, I mean, from what you've heard there. Like, how has it changed for you? Would you accept that a paper like the Sunday Times now isn't really about giving news to people, it's, it's more about filling in the analysis around it? <coughs> well, no, I don't accept that at all. Um, Sundays are slightly different from daily newspapers. Sundays don't work to the news agenda of the, of the day, as dailies will tell you what happened, you know, that's, that's where they use and so on. Some of the newspapers have a different perspective. You try to you try to set the agenda for the final week. That's all the Sundays do, you know, very degrees of success. So I don't think you can totally discount the news thing. But we don't actually consider ourselves to be in the news business. I mean, we're actually in the entertainment business. I mean, you're actually are trying to get people to give up a couple of hours of their time on a Sunday to read your paper. That's a huge ask because there's so many uh, competing things out there uh, that it takes a lot for somebody to go out and actually buy your paper, sit down decided to spend an hour or two hours reading the paper. So we've always got to remember that. Obviously we've got a, we've got a, a, a very big package of, <coughs> of content. And is that new for you, Frank, from the time that since you started in journalism? Like, is that something that is taking out of Yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, well, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have started out thinking that way. Obviously we're just producing a newspaper. But over the years, it's quite clear that you are competing, and the same with all the other forces, leisure time, people have been so busy during the Celtic Tiger, you know, people didn't have that much time, so you really were uh, pushing to, to sort of uh, get your, your um, face in front of the readers. And what newspapers, and where the difference, I mean, obviously, what Boris said is correct, there is huge, um, you know, there's a huge opportunity in the market at the moment, um, but newspapers and uh, broadcast media will coexist uh, with the internet, with social media. But as the, as social media expands, as, as internet expands, uh, you are getting, you know, a, a huge break up in the market. And when newspapers, where, where newspapers will continue to uh, succeed, is that they have put huge investment behind brands, behind names. Uh, you know, we spend millions every year producing a newspaper. Many, many millions, too many millions. But, you know, what you get at the end of the day is you get a marketing, you, know, you market that product, promote your writers, promote your sections, and over the years, not over a week or a year, over many years, you build up trust among readers, they know what they're going to get roughly if they go to your paper, uh, they believe that they can trust it, uh, you don't get everything right all the time, but you get it right enough of the time for people to say, I can trust that paper, and that is essentially where newspapers must continue uh, to market themselves, that they are a source that you can trust, uh, with writers you can trust, whereas if you just take any other opinion on the internet, that's not going to replace newspapers. It might be interesting, uh, but it's not going to replace newspapers. Obviously, huge difficulty for you recently with the, the News International story, well, the phone hacking, the phone tapping. I mean, do you think that that kind of has caused problems with more traditional media? In like, that well, no, I mean, well, 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 there, there is. I mean, people have a view on tabloids, and they take, you know, some people just don't like tabloids, and that's the way they post stories. So a lot of people weren't that surprised, maybe the extent of it they were surprised at. But well, people were ready to believe straight away, well, that's tabloid newspaper, what do you expect? I mean, the best you can say is that the stories were all true because they were taken directly from conversations. So you think you were in your trauma, do you? think you brought to the media I, word no, I mean, no, well, you know, on the table? Well, yes, I, well, we weren't personally affected by it, I mean, in terms of our sales. So, but it has been ring fenced, you know, there were people who did things they shouldn't have done, clearly. Uh, a lot of people have suffered as a result, including the victims, obviously, of the, of the phone hacking. A lot of people who have nothing to do with it lost their jobs. And it's just an episode which we've got to live with. Nothing we can do about it. We've just got to move on and 
trying to try and correct the mistakes of the past, and um, that's what they do. Okay, and Susan, I mean, you, you're on the journal.ie. Can you just describe where the market for the journal.ie? Like, for who are you catering for? Do you think who's, who's reading? It's, it's interesting because there is a perception that if something is on online that it's uh, possibly very immediate, which of course it is, and that it's also just the first thing that's happened and that there's no development of the story and so on. Um, with the journal study, I, I think we are quite lucky in the sense that, as you're saying, you know, we could, you can go to your device, you can go to your iPhone, your smartphone, you go online, you're in work, loads of people are, you know, you're connected to the internet, and I think Facebook and Twitter are probably out banned in certain corporations, but mostly people can actually get onto the internet. So they can check, and that's what we find is, the pattern coming into the journal study is uh, the same user will come in maybe four or five times, different points in the day, trying to catch up with what's going on. Um, but for us, that actually creates a different type of pressure. And it, it also requires what you might refer to as traditional journalistic attributes, which involves not ever putting anything up that isn't true that you haven't checked out yourself. And the reason being that, for example, the journal study, it deals a lot with breaking news, and it deals a lot with news that has been broken elsewhere as well, but we'll try and move it on, we'll try and find another angle on it, because stories develop, they don't just exist in a vacuum, and then they appear in one place, and then they disappear. We know that because we're still talking about it on the radio, the following morning, or, you know, prime time, or Tuesday night, or front line, the following Monday, um, and possibly, you know, a longer review section in, in something like the Sunday Times. They come back and find a different angle. What we find is if we're doing something like this breaking news, people will be very, very quick to say, that's not true, I was there. And it's immediate, it's absolutely immediate on the internet, and you have to be so responsible with that. And if you kind of come in at it as if it's a blog, as if it's something that doesn't have the same um, responsibilities and the same, uh, I suppose, scrutiny on it as something that's in black and white, thing is, it's on the internet, people can go back and check it. I've had people who have said to me, we, we were trying to get in touch with somebody yesterday, and he said, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that, but uh, I didn't much like what you wrote about me six months ago, and put the link back to the story that we did. So it's very um, transparent. <coughs> I mean, Connor, like, there's somebody working on the Irish Times, how do you react to the arrival of something like the journal.ie? Do you see that as, you know, they're just taking our story? Um, and so it's <laughs> well, it's very easy to be sitting off the journal because I think in its earliest iteration it was it, the product set itself out to be another Huffington Post and it's going to be this aggregator of content and what happened was they were just taking content from the Irish Times from the Irish Independent and the Examiner and my name appears so frequently in the journal that I thought I was working for them on, on, on some occasions. So you were getting credited? Well, yeah, but at, at five paragraphs down, after they'd lifted the first four paragraphs and pasted them under their own banner. And to be fair, there's, there's no such thing as copying things from there, never was in the Well, I mean, Because if that was the case, we're open a year now, we would, we would have been shut down. Right? Well, I think I, I, all I know is that I've, I, I've read the content, the copy that I've written, and I've read the copy that has appeared in the journal, and it bears a remarkable similarity. Now, I'm not saying that that's, ha that's happening today. I think the journal has actually evolved over the last 12 months and it has become a better product. Now, having said that, I don't want to knock the journal because I think it, it, it serves a really good and valuable role in, in, in Irish media. And I think the Irish Times and all the big national newspapers should be big enough to welcome the challenge that the, that the journal is putting down. Having said that, it's not a content aggregator and it's not, it hasn't been some kind of latter day Huffington Post. But the reality is that. We, we talk about the pace of change in, 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 in media circles over the last 15 years. Now, I started working at the Irish Times website in 1996, and we were one of the first 30 newspapers to go online. And, it, you know, but there have been about four or five absolutely seismic shifts in the media since that time. And if you said even six years ago that social media would have been a big thing, nobody would have had any idea what you were talking about. So the pace of change is the thing that people are really struggling to get their heads around. And one of the things that uh, kind of I'm slightly gratified by today is that probably the only media grouping that is worse at adapting to the change than newspapers is the PR uh, community. <laughs> because, uh, the reality is, and at the risk of alienating the entire audience, the PR community hasn't got a clue how to handle the social media revolution that we're living through. And sometimes I look at the PR community. Well, why do you say that, Conor? Because they've lost control of the message. And the idea has always been, that, well, or the idea in a lot of PR companies is that they control the message and their idea is to sell certain that story to the newspapers and then we run with that story, or we don't. Now, 
social media, Twitter, Facebook has just unleashed this beast that the pure, the pure industry is really struggling to get the handle the head around. They don't know if they should be um, coming to us with stories, or coming to bloggers, or going to people who have big influence on, on, on Twitter. And it really is baffling. Because, and we don't know, incidentally. We don't know where, the, where we're going to be in two or three or five years. And also, I think it's very <coughs> funny that I disagree with Frank when he says, when he talks about the newspaper and the web. The newspaper is the web. And that's what we have to understand. The Irish Times may not exist as a printed product in 25 years' time. The Irish Times will exist as an online product. And that's, the, that's what we're looking at here. There is going to be a huge convergence. The Sunday Times may not exist as a printed product, but it may exist online. Or it will hopefully exist online. No, I, I, I said they actually coexist. <coughs> and they coexist at the moment, yeah. but eventually it may migrate. It may, it may. And what we, say, what we say may, I have no idea what's going to happen. But the reality is that the, the, the branding and the trust that people have in the Sunday Times and in the Irish Times and in, all, in other newspapers will continue to exist because I know for a fact that if a big news story breaks, if a big massive news story breaks today, people are not going to turn to the German right now. They're going to go to RT and they're going to go to the Irish Times. But That's it's, 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 it's interesting, because I, I agree on one level where it's a sense of brand awareness and what's been there for a long time, and the, the, you know, the number of people who follow it. But I can begin to tell you how massive a growth we've seen in the 12 months. Oh, should we see okay. yeah, see yeah, no, absolutely. Increasing. But look, for example, th there is a certain thing about, <coughs> we've talked about people questioning um, traditional media and who we set on the agenda. Um, we were pretty young, I think, when the Cork Airport crash happened earlier this year. It's not something you can spin, it's very much a PR free zone. At the same time, because we were online, because we were constantly updating, we had a massive, massive traffic day. We knew we had to get it right. So we, we made sure everything that went up, bearing in mind what kind of a situation we're dealing with, we made sure that everything went up was 100% kosher and we checked out, we interviewed people and so on. But we always had the pressure of keeping it up. I heard a national broadcaster talk about the death toll, and it was higher than the number of people who were actually on board the plane, which is something we knew because we'd be talking to the DA and the control call, and also to Max Airlines. Okay. Um, and so I'm just saying that. That's fine, as long as those brands continue to create trust correct. at some point getting into that brand. But I'm just saying, that how do you get it, it will also be called, what I'm saying is the onus will also be on those brands that currently exist to show that they are still trustworthy and that they will also work online. Because not everything that newspapers are doing to get online is working. I can't criticise because we're also trying to test things. We've done things differently. We started off live tweeting events with Fianna Fáil were imploding there when the old merchant decided to step down suddenly on a Sunday. We were the only place that you could read about that live. That's not true, actually, because we would have had that live on our site as well. See, that's no, we were live tweeting it. It was immediate. It wasn't an hour later or whatever. No, no, we were but, live. Well, fairness to me. Yeah, and okay, and that's I, fine. I, I, and I totally, I think the times are very, 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 and also you talk about getting things wrong, I think it's worth pointing out that when Amanda Knox was found, was cleared of the murder of uh, last night, an awful lot of media organisations got it wrong, including the journal. We had a live stream so people we, could actually see it for themselves. We sent out a tweet saying Amanda Knox has, had, you know, has been found guilty, or the guilty verdict has been upheld, because everyone was watching it on Sky News. And Sky News was reporting of the event, created the impression, the first 30 or 40 seconds, that the guilty verdict had been upheld. And that was tweeted by yourselves, it was tweeted by the Guardian. See, but let's just yeah, the was great about that. 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 Because it did have produced an entire ready to go story based on the guilty verdict being upheld. They had quotes from the prosecutor, they had poor old Amanda Knox being led away to the jails in tears. They submitted, they, they published the story live, they, it, and it was on the site for quite some time. And that's a traditional media yeah, organization. That is the problem. But this is the problem if you're a traditional and you put it up, and as you say, it's still cashed. In Google Flash, which is something you kind of have to understand. So, Susan, the basic point is, how did the journal get that wrong last night? Well, then, exactly the same thing, watching a live stream, picking up the wrong thing, but then immediately correcting it and sending it out. And that is very, very rare that that will happen. But the point is that we can respond so quickly to something. I mean, how many people here have had stories put in papers that misrepresent a client in some way? And you can, it takes, it takes how, how long to get a correction? And also, will people see that kind of thing? So, I'm not, I'm not, so I'm not you know, I'm is, just saying that there but, is, but the story of course, there will be mistakes. The story you just said there is yeah. it's symptomatic of what's happening with the internet. There is this rush to be first, yeah. not to check. <laughs> That's right. We must be first, and then if you're first to say, you read it here first, we broke it. And 
you will hit mistakes like last night and other occasions. But that's your modus operandi. And it'll be very, very rare. That is the only thing. But, no, no, but that's, 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 that's why you lose the first. be wise to the first. And I think that's because we are coming from the traditional media background. And that's, that's, what, we, that's what we say. So, for instance... And, you know, but I just gave an example of traditional media doing that as well. I'm saying it's something we're all learning Okay, about. okay, let's, let's, move, let's move on from this for a minute. I mean, obviously, like I said, the three of you get real stuck in here. But, I mean, if we could move on to the way... I'll go to you, Frank. The way social media has changed the way the journalists do their jobs, you know, with your reporters, has it, has it changed, you think, the way the story gathering? No, not, not, not dramatically. I mean, social media, I mean, the way we use it is we use a publicity tool. That's, that's really it. We use it to do, we started off doing our own view of the papers, so decided to buy our own papers, then we do everybody's papers. Yeah, it's uh, terrific. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's good fun. Are you fun. not obligated to go contact, by No. <laughs> <laughs> that's because I get in contact with their slagging off stories. It's slightly different. Oh, aggregating with a leg. Aggregating with a leg. Yeah. Hang on, hang on. I forgot to say at the beginning. This is open to the floor at any point. Anybody wants to. Please. Join in. Just, just like a signal. But in terms of influence, I mean, when you get better known on on Twitter, as most of us are on Twitter, you people will, will give you stories via Twitter, which is great. We find Twitter useful uh, for find case studies for some story we're doing, we send out a message, anybody that experiences this, and you always get a positive reaction. You always get somebody say yes, you know, and you get your story that way. So it's a useful research tool, if you like, uh, and occasionally you will get people who will give you chip-offs via, via Twitter. Um, that's really it. So it's, it's part of the mix. It's, it's just a different way of giving you space information. Yeah. But do you have rules and regulations about how your staff operate on Twitter? Like, do you control... Well, we try not to. We, we, well, when you come from a newspaper background uh, where you're always conscious of defamation, that's clearly the big the major concern, is that you say you don't have any defamatory. We have a fairly liberal policy uh, in, in the newspaper generally. There's no really hard and fast rules. You don't talk about your internal, your internal carry on. You don't slide off your boss. You don't defame people. You can slide off your boss if you like, at your own risk. But, <laughs> <laughs> so be it. But no, I mean, we have a fairly liberal attitude towards, towards Twitter. You're not restricted to commenting on the media. You comment anything you like to say, but the journalistic rules apply. You don't go on and say something isn't true, and we care not to pay people. Yeah, and uh, Connor, I mean, on that point, it is kind of one of the fundamental things about social media is that interaction between the audience and the readers and the generators of the stories is it's much closer. Yeah. Is that something you would use as a journalist? Absolutely, and, and it is great as one except it doesn't replace traditional journalistic methods by any means, but it's just another tool that we have at our disposal. So if you need to find, you know, somebody who spent 1,500 euros on a communion dress in, you know, for a piece you're doing, you'll find that person on Twitter. Whereas it might become, it might, it might be much more difficult uh, in, in, maybe 15 years ago. But it's also a great source of, of tip-offs, of, of breaking stories. Like, for instance, give you the example of the death of Michael Jackson. That was first reported on TMZ, the website. Um, it was tweeted uh, uh, via the TMZ website. And, you know, we would have had, to, uh, because I, I just happened to be on, on, on Twitter at that moment, like I am almost every moment of every day. Um, and we, we got the story um, through, the, through that source. So it meant that myself and a colleague who were working on Breaking News could start work on the story. And we actually, were there, we, we were slightly ahead of even Sky News. Um, now, we wouldn't have, under any circumstances, published anything on, until we saw a doctor standing on the steps of the hospital in L.A. saying Michael Jackson's dead. But it gave us a heads up that something was unfolding. And Twitter is really good for that, depending on the kind of people that you follow. Now, but, but, the, but the really important thing, that, and you talk about guidelines, um, we, one, of the, one thing that we would say to everybody on, in our newspaper, we don't have any kind of prescriptive guidelines. We don't say you can do this, you can't do that, you must say that, you must say the other thing. And nobody in the Irish Times tends to... Uh, Use Twitter with you know you know we all have our you know views are, are, are not that of my employer and we don't tweet under Connor Pope Irish Times or whatever it might be but you know you have to remember some really basic rules and it's like, you know you don't want to defame somebody but also if you just and this is one one piece of advice that I would give anybody who's, who's using Twitter you have to consider it like broadcasting because you are broadcasting it doesn't matter if you're broadcasting to two people or twenty thousand people and if if there's something that you wouldn't say on drive time on our morning Ireland you might want to consider whether or not you should say it on Twitter. So if you want to slag somebody off, 
Um, as long as you can stand over that, uh, that particular piece of abuse uh, in another forum at another time or knock yourself out. But, you know, you have to remember that you're a broadcaster. And, you know, if you, can't, if you don't want to see what you've said on Twitter appearing on the front page of the Daily Mail in two days' time, well then maybe you shouldn't be saying, that would be one of our rules of thumb, not the Daily Mail, whatever, any newspaper. So it is, you know, it, it, but it is a minefield and it is quite difficult to get ahead of it. Paul, to bring back to, to PR for a moment, mm -hmm. do you find in managing clients that this whole, the growth in social media has made it more difficult to manage the message? <sighs> I think, yes and no. I think, <laughs> it's a classic answer, classic PR answer. Um, I think I, I, would, I would broadly agree with Connor's statement earlier on that you know, the PR industry hasn't really got their head around this. I think to be, that do, does actually remove the reality that there are, there are, there are, PR, there are organisations with either their internal PR or using agencies like ourselves, not just nationally, internationally, who are doing it very, very well. And the fact that they're not in your face is actually evidence that they're doing it very, very well. The reality is the ones... Can you give examples of that? Can you cite examples? Well, it's, 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 the point is that there's... Yeah, you know, it can be an exhibit. I don't want to get into individual cases if I prefer not, but I think there are, there are lots of examples of PR organisations, and I would include probably most people in this room, who actually give good advice to people and things are managed well and quietly and they happen and they happen appropriately and the right people get to know about things at the right times. But then the stuff that doesn't work is the stuff that gets covered and gets a lot of fuss about it. So I think it's a bit of a generalisation that I think I would defend to say that PR doesn't get it entirely. Because I think there are a lot of people in the communications industry that are quite aware of what's going on or whatever to manage it. The reality is the scale of change, the pace of it and the sheer volume of it is that we're nowhere near getting our arms around all of it, and there are a lot of people who still haven't got there. And it is very easy to see examples of that on a daily basis. Either people get it wrong, or things aren't followed up, or, you know, there's a currency factor. I mean, I would actually, the, attending to social media, if I could describe it that way, is like customer service. It's 24 7, and it's about small details. It's not about the big strategic move that you might make once every three years or once every year. It's not about the big grand thing that you do once in a while. It's not about dramatic move. It's all about little details on an ongoing basis, having a consistent face 24-7 that you're able to attend to the sentiment of the market. You're able to attend to the message you're trying to get across all the time. And what are, what are the opportunities do you think that social media offers to, to PR people who want to handle their clients? Well, ultimately, it is a medium to get directly to your customers. Okay. Cut out the media altogether. No, no, compliment. Because I don't think you can cut out the media. Media are a fundamental part. I mean, depending on what you're doing. I mean, we chatted, I think, earlier on on ourselves. Like, we were saying, like, there's a lot of what I would do on a day-to-day -day basis. is business to business. There are clients that I have, that I have happened to be dealing with, for whom th th their name would mean almost nothing to consumers. There are other clients who are selling everything from bottled water <coughs> to mobile phones, who are household names for every consumer. So depending on your objective for the client, the consumer may be a very important part of it, and therefore the consumer is taking on board Facebook, they may be involved in Twitter, they may be on discussion boards, they may be on specialist sites depending on their interests, whether it's music or sport or whatever. Uh, you have the likes of TripAdvisor for travel, you have food sites. So depending on who your customer is, depending on who your client is, and depending on who their customer or their client is, any one of a number of different choices of social media may well be a direct route for them. I mean, if you're dealing with a product for newborns, a rollercoaster.ie is going to be a baby, you know, site, etc. If you're in beauty products, beauty.ie, and so on. Something you were saying so, earlier that I thought was interesting is that you can set the news agenda with social media in a way that you maybe can't through the traditional media. You know, well, well, I think it's back to, to echo the point that Frank made earlier on. I mean, the, the reality is that, let's say, I take the presidential election at the moment. Um, you know, somebody asked me the question um, some time ago about the efforts of individual candidates on social media. And I, I would express the view that I don't think the selection notwithstanding the fact that there may or may not be posters, I don't think anybody is going to win this election on social media. As in, we're not going to persuade a sufficient number of individual voters to change or to establish a pre preference based on social media activity alone. However, I do think that if you look at it on a daily basis, the sentiment that is directed into the public domain through Twitter, or particularly through Twitter, or to a lesser degree through Facebook, the other media are picking up on that, and stories can build up momentum. So, you know, and if you want to use an example, the infamous Brian Cowan situation, whatever it was, in September of last year, that started in the mainstream media, but the commentary on it started in social media, and the news agenda was, was, began to take its route from there. Now, the event happened. Brian Cowan was the newsmaker. 
the, the, he went on to the media, he made news by performing in a particular way, but the commentary on it in social media began to actually establish sentiment from people who hadn't heard the interview. Yeah. Okay, fine. The problem for PO people with social media is that people on social media own social media. It's owned by the public. It's not owned by anybody. It's not like a newspaper or or TV or whatever. So uh, I think PO people, <coughs> if they try to influence debates on Twitter, it will just be rejected. It will be completely rejected. So I think that's a real problem for PO companies. If somebody's on saying something about a client of yours and you don't like it, if you get on, it only adds flame to the fire. Sorry, Hugh, just if we can, uh, Conor Dempsey on the PO side. I absolutely agree with you, Frank, but it, it's, um, it's kind of, we're talking black and white here, and, and if, if a PO company is on trying to influence the debate through transparency, or trying to do it at all, but certainly trying to do it with a heavy, obvious hand, it's about PO companies. So I think PO companies that think that, um, you know, we did start out, certainly I started with PO, where the, the, uh, it was all about controlling the message. If you think you're going to control the message or you're, for your client, if your client thinks that, you're going to be out of business very quickly. So we're all, we're all trying to figure this thing out. We're all trying to, to, to grapple with it. There's lots of opportunity in social media for, for PR companies. But for, for me, the way I try to explain uh, what, I, what I'm attempting to be about these days for clients is that, you know, it's still our story. We should still have the biggest influence on what people say about company X. Because if, if we don't, then we let other people will manage your reputation for you. So you're not going to be able to control as you did before, or as you thought you did before. But you should be able to have the biggest influence on what your own story is. Oh, I, I, the I, ball I, is that I agree with that. Yeah. that, it's that the opposition. You're, you're used to dealing with, um, you know, you can phone up, you, let's say, you know, the six people have to phone on this story. Somebody's got it here. And you can talk to one person in a newspaper, and you can do it on a one-to-one -one level, and you can try and influence something. Now, you can't do that on social media at all. At all. So, that requires a huge shift in terms of how you want to manage a client's reputation online. I think it's okay I, to have a Facebook page and all that stuff. Again, something bad happens. But so it's time, you know, there, 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 are, there are some, some influences on, on social media uh, are have the potential. If you got to, again, if you, you want your, your champions, you identify people on social media who are significant uh, people in their sphere. And if two or three of those um, over, you know, if, if you want to switch the light on, you know, and get things happening within the next hour, big ask, you want to be very lucky or whatever else. But if you've been creating Helping create, facilitate momentum, and the, that person on, on social media trusts you, etc. But then things can, can begin to happen. So it's all, it's all shades of grey. It always was, and it just even more was. I mean, if, it, it, you know, we're talking sort of in, in the abstract about a client error, you know, mm -hmm. a, a situation. To Connor's point, you can't absolutely change things on the on the now unless you just happen to break lucky. But the client or us, we have to have. You talked earlier on about trust, and it's, it's a big part of this thing. If either the PR representative or the entity you're representing. Are organizations that have established some reference point of trust, whether it's with the individual on social media, sorry, I just happen to be quite your direction on, but an individual who might be influential on social media or with the people in general, then their word stands for something. If, on the other hand, you're representing somebody who has not established that trust, whether they're entitled to it or not, is another word exactly, but they haven't taken the time to understand the medium and begin to establish some trust and put down some roots, then they will get wiped. And then you have to make a judgment, frankly, whether being wiped on social media today is going to impact, ultimately, my objective. Because if it is, then I need to change my game plan entirely. I need to redirect my resources towards that. But if you're talking about something that actually, you know, you make a judgment call that the audience on Twitter at this moment in time isn't the one that is impacted most on my audience. So for example, I've dealt with clients in, in, in say, the educational sphere who, at a particular level, didn't have a need to, they, they, they were, they were, their focus was entirely on people in public service and decision makers, and the Twitter thing was passing by at that moment in time. So let's not go down there today. We need to be there over a period of time, but we don't need to be there today. So it, it's, it's a whole series of different judgments. But if you're not there today, then the, the time that you do want to get a message out, mm -hmm. people will go, I'm um, sorry, what are you talking about? For I example, look, look, let me give you a little example, and it's, it's, it's not to come at a particular political party, but it is a political party, it's a major one that's in power. And we have, <laughs> um, they, they had a very, in the general election campaign, they had a very much a strong, we're going to be all over social media, this is going to be the social media election, which even us who very much work within the social media sphere knew that it wouldn't necessarily be the social media um, election. But they did very much try to harness social media, but in such an obvious way on one level, and then on the other level, being so underhand about it, 
that people who were just your ordinary Joe so who have been on Twitter for two years could see it through it straight away. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have polls on the journal every day. They're not scientific, and we never pretend they are. What they are, an interactive tool for people to come on, leave comments, have debate about one particular topic of the day. That's all they're about. This particular party sent out an email and a social uh, network and media uh, notification to all its grassroots members to go on and skew the journal's polls, skew being their word, not mine, in, in, a, in fact what. And one of their people who's on Twitter felt, even though they really supported this party, were like, don't tell me how to use my personal social media thing. Send it to us, and we went, okay, we're going to print this. This is really interesting, because our, our people are come to us a lot through Facebook and through Twitter, and they found this really interesting because it gave an insight into how the whole thing works. You know? But that's like the live line. I mean, yeah. they found the live line. And you can tell the opinion. But Susan, that's a, that's a bad example. I've heard a few bad examples. Yeah. Have a good example. Um, good examples. We have a lot more people come around. I can really see the difference in, in six months, even, to people coming to me from PR companies and marketing companies with a specific to angle for me, understanding where we're coming from. Um, for example, we were the online media partners for the Absolute Dublin Fringe Festival recently. So we had committed to a certain amount of coverage for them every day. But we said to them, it's not going to work, that we don't have a theatre critic for one thing. That's something we, who are also under financial pressure, are not going to invest in. So we decided, well, why don't you give us a carrot of two tickets every day for a show, and we will run as a competition on our site, and we had reader-generated reviews, which you talk about trust in a brand and a particular person, and obviously I don't think they should replace theatre critics or your, your Donald Clark, who I read every week in the Times to find out whether I disagree with him this week or not. Um, but there is room for people being given a platform. And so the fringe people that I dealt with, they totally understood that. And they had great ideas for things that would work well in the journal, as we had ideas for them, which was completely different from other campaigns they had run online previously. Um, so that was that was an interesting way. That was a creative way of looking at it. I don't know if it's because they work in the creative sphere. A lot of them were also very involved in internet startups and stuff. So I don't know if that's where it was coming from. But certainly, all I'm saying is that just because um, social media is your ordinary soap on the street, who is not qualified in a particular way doesn't mean they should be seen as naive because they're not, they're more expert than you are. They're probably more expert than you are. On, on a positive note for PR people who have to say it's time for trouble or whatever, you know, they think we should manage this, it's probably good advocacy in Orange because the attention span of social media is like that. And it is a remarkable story that lasts 24 hours. Remarkable story. And like the story thing are just going to be massive. And the next day there's not a single comment about it. And it used to be, we used to call it story of one week wonder from the newspaper business. But in the internet, it's like 24 hours is a lifetime. But well, people who attend their patch can do very well. Like, I don't mean to point out Barry Kenny here, but at Irish Rail, that Twitter account is absolutely amazing. People really, really trust it. And it's completely, obviously, a corporate entity. It's Irish Rail, it's not, it's doing what it says on the tin. But people, if, if something is happening, at the time's bad weather, and there was some serious problems with, with commuters, and there was one day when there was a bit of a squash, in uh, Conley Station, and Irish Rail were like that the whole time on Twitter, keeping people updated. And even though people were annoyed, it somehow managed to diffuse the frustration. And I don't want to spoil it, Barry, because I'm probably giving out to get something tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not favouriting Barry, but I'm just saying it, it, that's somebody that they're, they're attending their patch diligently, but, but the being very open about it. And it, it is, critically, they are not pretending to be anybody else, it's not anybody else pretending to be them. It is Irish Rail, or it is Barry Kenny, or it is and it's identifiable and the point of trust comes up. And I think, you know, going back to perhaps this thing, there's one of the things we have to get our heads around is this is not an overnight game. And being able to actually develop that kind of trust involves the kind of, you know, the shoe level that an elbow grease that perhaps the PR industry, like every other industry, but as much as any if not more, over the last ten years kind of forgotten. Because you know there are just there are more places, there are more contacts, there's there's there are more eyeballs cut needed to cover the space and understand how it works and listen and listen 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 listen. Yeah. I think that's a critical part of getting to understand this because there's it's coming from a number of it's, it is a fragmentation so it means you have to cover more spaces and, and cover more and understand where people are coming from to understand what challenge your client faces and then advise accordingly. Okay, I mean, I suppose one key area here we haven't looked at at all is the money of the issue. Uh, and it, like looking at something like the journal.ie, will it be here in five years, you know, with the Sunday Times? 
Uh, if we start maybe with the paywall issue, the Sunday Times has a paywall. The Irish Times doesn't have a paywall. But we example. did have a paywall. But you did, and you dropped it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So can we explore that a little? Like, Frank, first of all, what does it mean for you as like editor, knowing that your readers are going to have to log on and pay for something if you're trying to direct them to your, to your online site? It means I sell more papers. So it works That's for you. We have, I mean, compared to the other newspapers, and the only difference I can imagine is we're not on the internet, like freely available on the internet. You've got to pay. Uh, you know, it's obviously it's a big, it's it's it's, it's reading a Sunday Times online is a big ask compared to reading a yeah. newspaper. There's a lot of stuff. So, but our our sales have held up remarkably well during what is a pretty terrible recession. And one of the reasons, undoubtedly. Because we don't have people migrating to the internet. In the UK, they do. They have the iPad is quite successful. The application, they run a seven-day week with the Times, has been pretty pretty successful to date. Uh, but they've seen that migration, and you can sort of say something like the Guardian spends a fortune on its website. I mean, but the Guardian is crazy. I mean, the Guardian has an amazing <laughs> website. It's ridiculous. Every single thing the Guardian, plus lots more stuff that isn't in the Guardian, appears totally for free. But it it's worry? crazy, it's it, like that's not a business. And they're losing money hand over fist. They lose like 25, 26 million a year. And, and, and they want to know why. I mean, this is absolutely <laughs> Why would you buy it? Well, I understand that the Guardian's digital, um, what, what, they're, what they're aiming to do is, yes, they know they're, and they're quite open about the fact that they're losing lots of money, but they have a rather large uh, company behind them, of which they are one branch. So they are being funded from within. It's not like they're taking But to what the end? Because they're not doing anything advertising. Well, so they're, what also, end? they're also taking a punt back. They're also taking a punt on the fact that in, that in five or six years' time, that the advertising that will be attracted to the Guardian by the sheer numbers of people coming on with paper. I can only imagine, I'm clearly not running the Guardian. I don't know. I mean, you look at the mail. The mail, the mail online, the the mail online so. though, is... <coughs> the, mail, the mail is, despite what you might think of it, they are an amazing operation. Mm -hmm. And they set up a mail online. And it concentrates pretty much exclusively on celebrities and sport. It is now the biggest website in the world. It's since the New York Times went by the paywall, you'd be pretty sure the next three come out. It was second before the New York Times went by the paywall. So it'll be the biggest online site in the world. Yeah. And it's not strictly the Daily Mail that you buy a paper version. It's a completely new website. Absolutely picture driven. So they've driven. Driven. And, and it's models. free, and it's free, but they're <coughs> charging enormous advertising rates. They have the model right. Whereas the Guardian says, we put the Guardian online and see we're going to do all the advertising immigration. They're not. The mail is using its name to produce a new product that brings in massive ad revenues. It works. So what, where does that leave the Sunday Times then? If well, the Sunday Times has got this iBad application, which is going to be well. We don't have it over here. We're very, we're very uh, slow on the iPad here because it's obviously a very small market. It's very expensive to produce the iPad version of the Sunday Times. Uh, that doesn't mean we'll do something uh, down the road. Do you, I mean, compared to the mail, do you think you're missing a trick at the moment? Do you no, no, the mail, is, the mail online is not the Daily Mail, that's what I'm saying to you. It's a different product using the mail's marketing muscle, using their business mouse, and creating something on the back of their title. That is not the newspaper. It's a completely different product. And it is extraordinary. I mean, you don't get to be the biggest internet site in the world. But they have all their news online. Yeah, this kind of, no, they do. But well. 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 it's it's just got extra. Much extra. It has extra. loads of extra stuff. And yeah. it's because yeah. the key difference is it's it has, Yeah, it is working. But, I know it's working. working. but it has all its news for free. So basically, your argument that you can't. No, no, no. You know, because of bringing the extra stuff, stuff, right? It's all the extra stuff that makes the site. All the extra stuff. It's not big. It's all the celebrity stuff. All the pictures of you. It's tons of extra stuff. Fundamentally, they have a massive online brand and a massive in the news agents brand. The Sunday Times, you could argue, you have a very big brand in the news agents, but you're not driving traffic to an online brand of the Sunday Times. And if that is where the future lies, maybe you're behind the times on that. I mean, you'll be happy to say we're going to go to business clearly, but no, we're not going to have business clearly. We have a very successful newspaper brand, one of the most successful around. You know, so you if we take time, if we take time to migrate the internet, fine. But I mean, our model is you've got to pay for it. But and that's it? a slow model, but it's one that ultimately we think will work. But does it work very well with Sunday papers? I mean, of people who bought, bought, buy newspapers and bought newspapers, and I've worked in newspaper industry for 14 years, and I love newspapers and I still buy them, but I probably buy them less daily than I used to, but I still buy my Sunday Times, my Sunday Spaces, because I love the supplements. 
And I, I don't know, I think that's the way that reading ha habits are going, even among the newspaper buying. So to a certain extent, I think, you know, the Sunday Times is, has a slightly uh, more privileged position than a daily paper, has less ground to fight for, because people still like to sit down with the suburbs. Okay, well, 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 the thing is, is there, I mean, the ABC is there for me to see what's happening in the market. And we're doing fine. Tabloids are having a terrible time. All tabloids, they're all being... Sophie Daily started pretty well, 4.3 million operations. Well, I'm looking at the sales of their, of their well, the Daily Stars also has, um, it's, got, it's got the, uh, this is the 50 50 with Desmond. It's got a, it's pretty low uh, production from what you the Sunday Times or the Irish Times in terms of. Okay, but it's also it's pretty it's different. Different. But just in terms of the ABC, so the actual sales of your readership, you still have a huge, huge number of people reading newspapers like me. Millions of people being used to be tired. So, okay, sorry, sorry. Frank, 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 Alan Terrell, most of the time. When will an Irish print paper and go online? Oh, just go to an online? Yeah. When is the Irish Times going to cease to print? I don't know if it ever will, to be honest. It's a possible question to answer. I mean, I, I don't mean to be late, it's a possible question. I'm actually, absolutely thrilled that Frank is so upbeat and optimistic because he's probably the only newspaper executive in the world who is so optimistic. <laughs> Similarly upbeat. Now, well, come you see, at my age, I'd be out of the business of figure size. <laughs> so, say, in my lifetime, I'm terribly optimistic. <laughs> I, I, I say it in jest, but you must be the only person who. Like, you look, no, at, if you look at the New York Times, if you look at all the British media, if you look at the Irish media, it's, a, it's an industry crisis, and nobody knows where it's going to be in 5, 10, 15 years. Oh, no, you see, if you can say we're an industry crisis, <laughs> it's going to be an industry crisis. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, I've lived through. I've lived through his, his little paywall, paywall experiment, and I wish I could say that it had been hugely successful for the Irish Times, because in 2001, we were flying high, we were the most heavily trafficked website in the country, we were all over, far ahead of the Independent and RTE, and then as a result of the economic difficulties that the newspaper found itself in, we had no choice but to introduce a paywall, and our readers reacted incredibly angrily to it, and the reality is that an awful lot of them migrated to uh, RTE for their breaking news. Even though I think anybody, nobody would argue that the RTE breaking news service is comparable to the service that the Irish Times breaking news site was offering, because there's only two paragraphs. I'm going to say this, but the reality is that people weren't prepared to pay for content online in 2001. And I don't think people have actually crossed that Rubicon yet. I don't think people are prepared to pay. Did you get the people back when you went through again? We, we have our traffic is incredibly, you know, our traffic increased are, yeah. dramatically. I, to be honest, I can't remember the, the, the actual figures, I should have probably looked them up. But you know, we're, 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 we're again one of the, the second most popular to the news website in the country. And, you know, Where are we revenue? I mean, have a day to make it. Again, this is a commercial just a thing that I have no interest in at all. The editorial side of mine is showing. Classic commercial. Commercial. Classic commercial. I'm not interested in the revenue side. No, but everything is sorted out, it'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, <laughs> keep the money coming. Connor, you said that the PR industry is failed to grapple. With and I also, media. Yeah, and I said newspaper. The newspaper has been in crisis. Yeah. So, you know, so we're all in the same boat. Exactly. Yeah. But why do you say a print, you know, a newspaper, a mainstream newspaper, will, will not see production? I mean, it's inevitable. It, well, possibly it is. I mean, if you look at the modeling, what's happening in the United States. They've already. Yeah. Lost the Tribune, mm -hmm. lost the Daily Star, something. Yeah. They, they did migrate online. Whereas in the, in the States, you've got the Christian Science Monitor, for instance shutting down its print operation and moving exclusively online. You've got a few other newspapers in the States that have done that. Sure. It, it, it might happen in Ireland. It probably will happen all over the world. And you might see things like the iPad and different kind of tablets, you know, stepping into the gap and giving people in newspapers on the move. Also, we have to hope that, you know, maybe the, the whole iPad model will rescue the newspapers and it will, it will allow people, or will, it will teach people how to pay for content again in much the same way that iTunes taught people how to pay for music again. Because if you remember back in 2000, 2001, everything was about Napster and Audio Galaxy, and the idea that you would pay for music online was just laughable. Whereas now, iTunes is a hugely profitable business, and that has rescued the music industry to a degree, although it's still in crisis. And we need something like that in, 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 in the media industry. And what I can't understand is I can't understand how, you know, there is still this reluctance to pay for content online, even though it's incredibly good value. I'm not talking about the Irish Times or in particular, but you know, 
People need to pay for content, because if people don't pay for content, content will stop existing. But, but can I just put that to Susan, and you have content online for free, like, do you see that as the long-term model for Jarrah.ie, or do you think well, look, we, we, We've always said we're not going to charge for content, okay? Now, we do specialise in a lot of snappy news, this is what's happening, but we have started branching out into doing longer pieces. And I can see where newspapers might start to look at the iPad or tablet as a saviour of some sorts. Um, whether or not you can justify the amount of stuff that you, you put on there for a read. But for example, at weekends we had longer reads. Uh, three weeks ago we did, when, when Greece was starting to look like it was going towards the default, um, all the reporters took a section each of what would happen to Ireland if Greece defaulted. So we had somebody look and talk to a sociological, psychological expert, um, economy, finance, what price would be your loaf of bread, be this kind of stuff. So it's rather long read and probably a little bit different from what we have been doing. But as Connor has pointed out, we are developing sites of things might change on that level. Um, we are able to see what are the most popular posts that are read by our readers through different devices, the top 10 every month. So what we started to notice is a massive difference in what people read when they're on the laptop, the mobile, where they can see a rather large screen, what they're reading when they're on the smartphone, and what they're reading when they're on the iPad. When they're on the iPad, the top story last month was that, which the people would not take right. from the but, but Susan, back to the basic question, question like, how is the journal going to make money? Like, well, A, are you making any money now, and long term, yeah. do you think you will? Are well, you going to unlike money? Connor, I, I take a, quite a rather large interest in whether we're making money or not, simply because that's my job depends on it, and I'm a realist about it, I'm a journalist, but I'm also understanding that I don't have a right to a job, and I don't have a right to a particular company, and if we fall in four years' time, it's because we're not making money. We're not making money now because we're a year in business and what startup is. But there is a model there for it. In four years' time, the hope is to be breaking even and then making a profit from there. For anyone who doesn't know, we're completely funded by the two Daft brothers. They're not Daft, Daft.ie. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not Daft. Yeah, yeah. Brian Fallon is a waste, that's okay. Brian and Eamon Fallon. So they're, they have put the money into it and they are funding it for four years. But after that, we stand or fall. And like these guys, I don't know. But they are really hopeful. And considering how well they have read how the internet has developed up to this point, I really have a lot of hope in the way that they are saying that advertising, will get there advertising is the way we're going to monetize. We're not going to monetize by putting any of our content behind the paywall. Okay. Um, a few people on the floor here. How are we doing for time, actually? Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, no, I'm sorry, I just wondered, is one of the big obstacles for, say, for the Irish Times, Connor, in closing down the printing presses and going online, that it brings you head to head with the state broadcaster online? Like, I know, for example, publishers in Britain say, as we might say in Ireland as well, like the might of, say, the BBC online is hard commercially for a publisher to take on. And by closing the printing press, really, you've taken away the one asset that separates you from the state broadcaster. We're not closing the printing press. <laughs> <laughs> that is not on the horizon at all. And I possibly in 25 years. But there is a, I guess there's an issue here for all of the mainstream media versus RT, in that RT is funded by the state. And that's hugely unfair when, we're to, when we tend to be competing in the same sphere. You know, we're competing online. Well, so why, does RT, why is RT funded by the state for its online operations, which are huge and advanced and they're growing all the time? It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, well, you know, how, how we respond to that, I think we have to continue to, to provide good, stimulating content that's original, um, that people want to, want to read, and we have to continue to innovate. That costs money. Where is the money coming from? We're getting some money through advertising. You know, the, the, we're going to have to open up a whole different range of, of, of revenue streams, which we've, we've been doing for like 10, 15 years, because we're not new to this game. We've been in the business for 16, 17 years. But it's tough, and it's tough when one of our big rivals is funded by the state. It seems to me, and it, it's exactly the same in the UK, except in the UK, the BBC doesn't take any advertising revenue. So the, so the RTE has it both ways. Advertising revenue on the one hand, state funded on the other, and worse, every other media organisation has to fight against that. Again, my other audience. And I just wonder, in all your um, media, what's the influence of your marketing people, the strike of your marketing people, to try and, on the editorial side, to try and get to your particular audience, you know, who are your audience? Frank, answer my question. Yeah, well, you know, we, we do, over the years, we carry out extensive uh, tracking research on readers, because we know it interests them, we know it doesn't interest them. Uh, there's obvious areas, straightforward, 
rugby is massive. Just, it's just massive for Sunday Times readers. They love rugby. They love rugby coverage. Uh, but in general, there's other stuff. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff you get into how people feel about themselves. Uh, during the Celtic Tiger, there was a lot of uh, tracking showing that readers wanted articles to be aspirational, for instance, stuff like that. So it's kind of touchy feely, but then you sort of you work around it and say, yeah, well, okay, that's not a bad way to go, you know. So, but it, it doesn't dictate what you do because journalists are journalists. At the end of the day, if they get a news story, that's the news story. The news story is not dictated. The softer parts of the paper may well be dictated by you know, this will be of interest to my readers. A news story to you may not be necessarily a news story. Or, or I don't use it. Your your in terms of the, <coughs> maybe your number one new story, maybe your number ten or eleven, you know. And that's why I wonder uh, how does the, the, the marketing, does your a picture of your audience come into your no, head? No, 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 I, I don't agree with that. I mean, a news story is a news story. If it's a good news story, it's good enough for the front page or whatever, that's it. I mean, there's no marketing behind what's in your news section. You know, the marketing may to what extent are we going to promote something in the paper this week. That's it's really that's really where it goes. It doesn't go any further than that. Well, bring Connor in on that for your point of view. I mean, would you do what Sunday Times do research with readers? Well, there's a huge amount of research done. There has to be every newspaper has to do research because you have to work out what 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 features and what elements work and what elements don't work. I mean, otherwise you're just kind of you know, throw, throwing everything at, 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 a, at a wall and hoping something sticks. Um, the stories that we know are hugely popular with our readers. Um, but I totally agree with Frank. News is news, and we're not—you know—the marketing departments don't dictate the kind of news coverage that we that we have because we know that certain stories are going to play well with our readers. Rugby, as, as you know, it will come, come as no surprise to you to know that rugby is massive uh, for us, but also it's more we, massive for us. <laughs> <laughs> So those kind of property stories, which were always of huge interest to readers of the Irish Times, are still of huge interest, all for completely different reasons now. Um, and then, you know, to be honest, sometimes I, it makes me laugh that um, we, you know, like every newspaper, we, we have a, a vision in our head of who our readers are and what they like. And then suddenly, the most read story on our site for three days will be "Man has hands bitten off by crocodile," um, <laughs> which ultimately, you know, those kind of stories are what people like to read. Yeah, well, we, we, we actually have, because we don't have marketing research people behind us and we don't even advertise ourselves yet, we're very much word of mouth, we have a few, I think it's on Facebook when people click in, um, but what we found, because all of our stories, you can see, if you went back and looked at the journal after this, you'll actually see how many people have looked at it so far today, and so we do get a great sense immediately, we know when we put up a story that something is going to take off, and we have to restrain ourselves from putting up the smuggling crocodile in pants through an area of the story. Uh, you know, you, you know, because you know they're going to take off and they're going to be shared, and we've had quite a few stories picked up by Boker, some of the bigger aggregators in the stage, which all of a sudden then get 140,000 people on in an hour, it's absolutely frantic, but you will also notice that we, we, don't, we, we do have an editorial process, so we do see we're not going to ignore something massive like a new set, even if only 500 people click on it today. Um, so you kind of, you have to have that. But where we might be a little bit different is we are a little bit driven by what people say they're interested in. For example, um, fracking, if anyone knows what it is, I'm sure you do now. Nobody seemed to know what it was three months ago when a reader got on to us and was very upset about what was happening in the Porcupine Basin and so on. And we said, this is really interesting, we're just going to do it because we're interested in it. Uh, we don't think people will be necessarily in the end of the snow or it's yeah. not rugby or whatever. You did a piece of last week. I'm sorry. Last week, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, three I months still ago. wasn't interested. <laughs> 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 three months ago, we said, we're going to do it. Because we're interested in it. Yeah. And that's what we did. It took off. And we didn't think it would. And what happened to us, we put up a certain viewpoint. Then we got the guy from Tamborne at some point and later. Um, Richard uh, Mormon, and he gave an interview about it. So you had this back and forth where people were actually able to take part in the debate. So in that sense, our readers set their own agenda. And then they came back and, and we started getting hits back to the site of something that was printed a month ago, which is really interesting. And it's a sort of feed into stories. I'm, I'm really interested in who's setting the news agenda and who will be in the future. Because for us, that was a real example of the reader setting it and generating the interest in it that we, editorially, wouldn't have normally put up. But everybody knows who fracking is, obviously. I, I just want to make a point. I'm just going to explain it on the journey. Sorry, so I did. So I did I, I, 
not to for a second what the guys are saying, but I think you know that in the broader church of the media, in the same way as you referenced the the alternative approach taken by the Guardian and the Mail to online a couple of minutes ago. I'm not sure that there, there are media, I suspect, who do take a very deliberate approach to pitching their storylines to a particular audience. And I would highlight the only evening paper in this town, which has, I don't know what they do with Freddie Thompson was killed. <laughs> seriously? Sorry, Fat Freddie. Okay. I just, seriously, now it puts me in mind of 25 years ago when I graduated from college, we did a dissertation, and a then colleague of mine, who may be known to some of you, is a radio television producer called Pat Amani, who's very active online. Pat O'Malley did a thesis for our dissertation on water on the headlines at the time of the Evening Herald. This would be back in 1985-86. And the, he, there was a, a, a big push on joyriding in the Evening Herald at that time. And he did a statistical analysis where he went right down and he got all the crime figures. And he was able to prove, absolutely, without, couldn't be contra uh, contradicted, that the rate of joyriding had gone down at that time. And he reckoned that the rate of joyriding had gone down commensurate with the level of attention. Now, either people were watching their cars and locking them up, or else the hoods decided this is more hassle than it's worth. But one way or the other, the, 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 the actual story being told was not actually borne out by the facts. But ultimately, the newspaper sales went up. Now, I think you'd have to say there must have been some sales and marketing influence on that, and I would see a similar parallel in terms of the attention on crime now in certain newspapers, because it sells. I'm well, shocked that you suggest that the Evening Herald is putting its headlines on the front page because I think it's sad. No, well, that's not. Sad, sad, sad. I take the point. I take the point. I think the point I'm making is that across the media as a whole, perhaps both of your organisations or both of your individual papers may have your own approach which reflects a knowledge of your audience and a confidence in, in, in the, like, the diversity of their interests that perhaps other newspapers wouldn't actually choose. Uh, well, no, well, no, I mean, the Sunday World, for instance, I mean, you know, for my sins, when I read the paper Saturday night, I read the Sunday World, and it's extraordinary. It's just wall-to-wall -wall crime, and there's clearly a market for wall-to-wall -wall crime, and they have that market. So, you know, yes, they know exactly what the readers want, and they get it in spades every week. Are you getting it every Sunday? Uh, Neil O'Gorman here. Just a question. It's just a comment, really, just on, at the risk of sounding a defensive on behalf of the whole PR profession. But I think um, th there are lots of differences, I think, in, in terms of how PR agencies go about their business. And I think, in the same way as you might, you know, you, you criticise for going all journalists are sort of, you know, dishonest or just looking to make a sort of a, a quick headline. PR practitioners are very different in terms of the way they go about their business. And I think rather than being challenges, there are many challenges that social media presents, but there's also lots of opportunities. And I think it's in the same way we've learned a trade by understanding what journalists like and don't like and understanding how to effectively pitch a story. Now, not everyone does that. It's the same way with social media. There are more... We never really had control of the story, but we have had an ability to influence to an extent. So I think if anything now, we've probably more opportunities to influence because there are more players online, there are more opinions that count. Um, every sort of media person represented there has a story that may be picked up by people on Twitter. People share it through all sorts of social media platforms. So I think the ability for a story to spread is, is, is absolutely invaluable now. And I think PR practitioners are learning to sort of spot where to pitch a story, how that's going to sort of, you know, sync up with social media channels. And also, I mean, there's so many facets, you know, we, we, we end up tweeting or, or providing content for people's Twitter pages, Facebook pages. So I think it's, a, it's such a multi, multifaceted um, thing now that social media is. And I think it's more how we influence and, I suppose, try and set the standards high for ourselves and really learn and continue to learn because the job is never done and there's new people whose opinions matter that are breaking through that we just need to to stay on top of. So I think it's, it's probably something that we could have another forum on as to whether we've lost control of the message, whether we ever had control, and if anyone has control, but maybe that's something for another day. So I think there's just a lot to discuss on that particular topic alone. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else on the floor who wants to, to ask a question? I've got a woman there towards the back. Hello, Leisha O'Mara, Cook Communications Manager in Tala Hospital. Um, I'd just like to ask the question of whether social media press releases are being used more and more, and if you find them useful. Not at all. From my perspective, I would almost never read a press release, a press release issued via social media. And I think most of my colleagues would be the same. I, it's just, I, I are they being used? You, you, see, you see a lot of people, you see a lot of companies, and by the way, just for the record, I wasn't dissing all 
<laughs> Some of you are brilliant. <laughs> um, I, I, I think sometimes I think it's, it's some some companies you overuse them and they just fire up press release after press release after press release via Twitter and I find that's a, that's a real turn off and very tedious and I'm not sure if that's the appropriate way to get the message out at all. Excuse me, would you see them? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I, don't, I just don't follow people whose whose accounts consist of of, um, of press releases. I just don't. Even if every third one is property, it's it's too much because you have to yeah. remember the amount of traffic that's coming at you on Twitter. Like I, we, of course, we use press releases and they're brilliant, and we do studies and we go to things and all based on what you send us in our email and continue sending it to newsletterjournal.e because I'm not sure we're on everybody's email server. Um, but uh, on, on, it just doesn't work. Because if you think about it, you're trying to shoehorn um, a specific product into a, a 140 character. It's not meant to be something you click through. It's something you meant to just read. You, you're not meant to uh, go on somewhere else from Twitter. It's a feed. And um, people get very annoyed if they need to do more work and then they click through and it's a press release. And it's, it's, a, it's a, an old traditional press release. That just isn't suitable for me. It's kind of anti-ethos. Yeah, yeah it's it is. It's, it's a little on. bit of like so standard, so yeah. It's, it's but what I was actually talking about was press releases that are written with social media contacts embedded in them. So photographs, uh, delicious accounts with various different reports attached to them. Do they exist? Do, are, are Irish people yeah. getting them? It's a lot of work to find those and you miss them. You know what I mean? In, in your tourist trip. Like I, I follow over a thousand people on my personal one video early, but on the journalist account we follow like maybe 600 because we have to filter out the white noise and that. It's actually a big problem with uh, the internet as well as the white noise, which is where we felt there was a place for an online only publication is because we were trying to filter out the internet news sites on the white noise for other people. I think it's, it's worth noting that in the context of the Irish media landscape, there are tools which are kind of talked up in larger media out, out markets like the US and the UK where there might be literally thousands of newspapers, stroke trade magazines, stroke whatever, and people have evolved the social media release as a kind of a variation on the press release that's kind of fundamentally the same thing but just slightly adjusted in terms of adjusted. Well, it's, it's, it's tangibly adjusted in terms of the way it's presented because you're broadcasting it to a significant group of people whose, whose use of it would be in a social media context, so it's adjusted for that point. But I think in the Irish landscape, the reality is, even if you took all of the people who are active in social media, and all of the people who are active in the mainstream media on any given day, there aren't that many people that you could pick up the phone to them all if you, if you, if you wanted to, and often that might be the best way to start the process. I mean, there are seven daily traditional newspapers, there are five Sundays, if you include some of the tabloids that are UK-centric but, but have Irish content. So ultimately, there, there, there aren't that many people for any given story. Going right back to the thing I said at the very beginning, you have to have a clear rationale in your mind as to why you're issuing something or why you're putting something out there and who you're trying to influence. And not everything is meant for everybody. Therefore, you know, generic releases hammered out there, by and large, either it's in social media or traditional media, are a thing of the past. You have to start thinking about, you know, what, in what context might you send the same thing to each of Connor, Susan and Frank? There's actually not that many. A, a former work, uh, work placement student when I was working in the Star as day news editor, he wrote an expose <laughs> of working in the Star. There wasn't, it was meant to be very nice, and he printed it in his local paper. And um, he spoke about coming in and talking to the day news editor. And, uh, at the time, he used to print out all the emails, which completely defeated the purpose. And um, <laughs> so he'd be plowing through them all and go, oh, for God's sake. Uh, bin, 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 oh, that might work. Bin, 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 you follow that? Bin, bin, and he was like, she told me 99% of them go with the bin, and he wrote in his local paper, um, you know, which was not true. And but it, it, it was not true. But uh, it does show that there is that the generic stuff doesn't always work. So there's no point in, I keep getting emails from my wine company. We don't have a wine column and I can't be bribed by wine. So please stop telling me you've 10% off your wine in, in bulk if I buy it. And I'd like to just associate myself with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Niall Quinn, Give Me Communications. Uh, just pick you up on one or two comments, um, uh, particularly in the Irish Times. What I what I find interesting is the, the what you mentioned, Connor, about the the the, the rank of the stories that are that are most read, and then also what Frank was saying about what the success that he feels that the Mail in the UK has had with their particular offering. 
Um, obviously, with the way the internet is structured, there there is a huge ability to 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 find out which stories are being read. And um, to what extent um, does the panel think that as we move move on and and people get more uh, visibility on that, and they see, for instance, that certain types of stories are more likely to be read? And, and what I find interesting with the Irish Times in particular is that it tends to be sports stories and the unusual story like the crocodile one that you're, 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 you're referred to, that newspaper outlets might turn around and say, well, we're not, people aren't really reading the other stuff, so why should we be devoting a resource to that? And it may in turn um, uh, contribute to uh, a devaluing of the content um, in, in, in mainstream media because they feel that there isn't, it isn't worth devoting the resources to it. Maybe it's ingrained in me from 15 years working in the Irish Times. We would take our responsibilities as journalists seriously. And it, we, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we were to just say, OK, we're going to not do the dull, worthy story, for want of a better word, because nobody's going to read that. We're going to concentrate on the more popular story, because that's going to generate an awful lot more traffic for us. And that's just something, and I can't envisage a day when the Irish Times would ever do that, because the newspaper has, has a fundamentally important role in our society. And that's to reflect, uh, to shine light into the shadows, and to, and, and, and to tell stories which are important. And um, that's what we have to continue to do. I mean, without, you know, I agree with Connor, absolutely there. We're very co-faced about these yeah. kind of things, obviously. But the paper you describe is actually called the Daily Sport. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually happened already. You will get all these wacky, crazy stories and loads of sport. In the day's work. And not that many buyers. And, and you know, you have to have variety in the market. You have to appeal to all sorts of people's interests. And not everybody is exclusively interested in <coughs> stories about crocodiles and whatever and, and sports. You know, they do like a bit of extra stuff in there, the, the, the hard stuff about diet. Um, so, I, you know, newspapers would never go that way. And I just, just this is the whole debate here. You know, it isn't really newspapers versus online. No. It's, you know, we do what we do. And people, like to buy newspapers still, they like the comfort of opening the paper, seeing the familiar stuff, seeing the variety of stuff in it. And people go online, particularly during the week at work, and they have a different experience during the week. So I don't think it's a question of either or. At the moment, because I'm an optimist, we're still at the uncertain stage. But I think, you know, newspapers may eventually become quite expensive. They may have a much smaller, uh, much smaller market in terms of uh, sales. Um, but people will always be willing, there will always be a market there as far as I can see, to buy a newspaper. It may be more expensive, I say, because once there will be a tipping point at some stage where the newspaper sales to some people will get level that think, geez, maybe we better go online, it's cheaper, we don't have a printing press, whatever. But at the moment, and for the foreseeable future, I think they will coexist. I don't think it's a question of, you know, we're totally competition and one is going to dominate the other. Um, if I could answer that question, um, I think the same thing is these two guys in terms of those stories would be there that you might not think are popular but the people aren't reading enough and I, I mentioned already that we have stories that you'll see don't go even into the yellow as we would call it in, in the barometer of who's looking at them but I can guarantee you if they're not there and I'm, the reason we keep them is not because you know we, we see ourselves as this great bastion of responsibility towards society or anything as Paul faced his words as that it's because it's a brand and if people they may not click through to that story, that's, and it won't count the click. They will see the headline. And if you're missing stuff, if there's something massive happening in Syria, and you haven't put something in about it, or if you haven't done Theresa Tracy, that pensioner who was put in jail, if you haven't done something about the protest that's happening on that, or if you haven't done something about the new cystic fibrosis um, unit over in Vincent's, people may not click into it, but they like to know it's there, and it's all part of building up the brand that you're, we're somewhere you can come and you will get what's going on, maybe an edited version but we'll keep you in, informed. People have this idea about what they want. So that's, that's a big difference between using a site like dig.com, for example, where you just look at something that has generated hundreds and thousands of clicks or whatever, and it will be full of alligators in your pants, or hummingbirds in your pants, was the story this week that had on. Forgive me, for you. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to, to comment or question, or shall we, shall we wrap it up there, Jerry? Do you think? Well, listen, thank you all very much for your participation. Thanks very much indeed to Frank, to Susan, to Connor, and to Porg.